Hello viewers, these are key messages from the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education on the coronavirus. Dear parents, keep children at home at all times. Avoid sending children to shops and markets. Do not engage children in petty trading on the streets and garages. Allow children to play within the confines of the home. Limit visitors into your homes. Adhere to COVID-19 health precautions and guidelines. Schools are closed but learning continues. Dear teachers, you are encouraged to desist from all forms of group activities involving students. All school premises should remain closed and not to be used for any other purpose. Thank you. Good day, viewers and listeners. My name is Samuel Emendi. And today's lesson, we are looking at ecology. And uh, ecology, I may start with the definition first. What is ecology, if I may ask? Ecology is a study of interaction between organisms and their environment. People interact with one another. Organisms in the forest interact with each other or with one another. And then in our day-to-day -day activities, we interact with living and non-living we also interact different ways. Sometimes we may not notice it. Sometimes we, we notice it. But in this discussion, or in this lesson, we are going to look at interactions. And uh, we said, as we discussed, ecology is the, is the interrelation between organisms and their environment. The, the picture that we are seeing on the screen is a particular type of fish. This is a quarrel fish. It's been cleaned by a cleanser rasa. Cleaner rasa are small fish that eat parasitic and diabetics of what large fish. Like sometimes when a fish eats another fish, some of the remains that attach to that fish is, is eaten by this cleaner rasa. So, we are also going to look at another interaction between certain types of ants. This ant is called an acacian ant that has a unique relationship with an acacia tree in which they live. Okay? If you look at this level of biological organization, these are different pictures, so in different images. We have one is organism, we have a population, we have a community, we have an ecosystem, a biome, and the biosphere. So it starts from a small unit to a larger unit. So the organism is the small one, like the picture that you are seeing there is the there. And there you are seeing populations of other animals. And that's a particular, uh, just a certain group of animals, that's a population of them. And in the community, we are seeing different organisms. We have a deer, we have birds, and also we have what mushroom plants. And here we have an ecosystem. Yeah, you can see the sun, you can see the sunlight, you can see the, the rain pouring down, you can see the animals, you can see the plants. It's an interaction, it's an ecosystem. And here we have a biome. We have land, we have water, we have also plants on top. 
And here you talk about the biosphere, the, the world, like, like the earth itself. So we are going to look at this one after the other. We are going to be defining them and be discussing. We say a population is a group of individuals that live in the same area, can interbreed and share the same gene pool. You know, like for instance, you cannot, uh, when you are counting population, uh, like for instance, when they are doing the population census, they have to count like human beings. Also, you have like in that, you also count like number of animals that are found there. But you cannot put human beings and animals as the same population. No, they cannot be on the same population. Either you count the population of cows, the population of goats, they must be of the same that can interbreed. Like, for instance, human beings, they have a particular population. Some of these cows, they have their own population. And the, the plants, they have their population based on their species. We say a population is a group of individuals or organisms that live in the same area, can interbreed and share the same gene pool. They share the same gene pool. So when there is a population, evolution sometimes tends to occur. You see, evolution occurs at a population level. Individual organisms cannot evolve. Formation of new species happen as individuals within a population undergo changes in their genotypes and phenotypes. Like for instance, in a particular place, you are living there and then you, you, you tend to move to another location. Sometimes the environment will make you to change your physical uh, makeup. Or sometimes some of this food that you eat may make you to change your genetic makeup. The genotypes, we talk about the genetic makeup of an organism. While the phenotype is the physical or the outward appearance of an organism. Due to evolution, people tend to change. Organisms tend to change over time. So from a population, we are moving to a community. A community, different populations coming together. Okay. Like for instance, we said a community is composed of all the different populations of species that live in a given area. There must be a different population of species that live in a different area. Like for instance, we, like if you look at the school, a school setting, we have a different communities there. We have the teaching staff, we have the students, you have also the, the ancillary staff, you also have what vendors. All of these people, they are all human beings, but they are doing a specific job at a specific time. Or also, you can also have the plants, like you have the garden, where the gardeners are there, they are doing their work. Or if you go to a, a, a zoo, where you have different types of animals, you are seeing that different populations there, they are in that zoo, performing their, their task, and people are feeding them, and other, everyone doing their own task to make sure that zoo is, is maintained and keeps on going. We say a community is composed of all the different population of species that live in a given area. Organisms within a community interact with each other. Ways that can be both beneficial and harmful. So sometimes when organisms interact, even the mouth and the tongue, sometimes when you are speaking, may bite your tongue. So that is what we are, you are interacting. That is it's an interaction that is taking place. And something happens to the, the tongue happens to be beaten by what? By the, by the teeth. Also, competition for what? Food. Like in a, in, in a population whereby we have different animals. Sometimes the stronger one will what? Feed. And the weaker ones will die as a result of what you call natural selection. We say competition for resources between members of a community is one factor that shapes evolution by natural selection competing for a particular thing. Like for instance, in this situation we are in, the COVID-19, you see, people will want to buy sanitizers. We are going to be competing for prices. The one who has more money will be able to, uh, to buy the sanitizers that he wants. 
because some of these people will charge at a higher price. But because as we are competing, and naturally, the one who has what, the money will be able to buy, and the ones that does not have the money will not be able to buy. It's natural. They, that means that it's the law of nature that, that dictates it. So we are competing. Like also when there is food, a lion and a tiger is there. They are competing like that's a deer. That they, want to, they want to kill these ones to eat. So the one that is stronger, we have to survive. And the one that is weaker, we'll have to give way. So an ecosystem. An ecosystem includes all living and the non-living factors that exist in a community. We talk about the living and the non-living factors. If you look at this picture, we are seeing the sun, the rain, the clouds or the sky. We see the deer and the plants. And you know, in, in between, there are different forms of what organisms that are found in that. So it's an interaction of what both the living and non-living non that exist in a particular community. We call it an ecosystem. Okay? And the bigger picture is the biome. A biome is a group of ecosystems that have similar climates, animals and plants. They all have what you call similar climates, animal and plant. What you are seeing here, these are what you call coral reefs that exist in both Atlantic and the Pacific. And, and this is an example of what we call a marine uh, biome. This marine biome is found inside what? water and is salt water. And what, these are the two biggest ozones in the world, the Atlantic and the Pacific. The Pacific being the biggest, followed by the Atlantic ozones. And uh, there's an interaction that is taking place in this biome. However, all reeds are found in shallows, nutrients-rich water, and inability by similar, or inhabited by what? Similar organisms. Some of these biomes are inhabited by what? Similar organisms. If you, sometimes, if you watch this television, this DRTS or some of these channels, you see they, they put on uh, uh, documentary on the, on the TV or on the channel, showing the different organisms interacting in different areas. Sometimes you see a biome there where organisms interact with each other. And, and when you talk about a biome, you say these are groups of ecosystems that have similar climate, similar animals, and plants. They can either be terrestrial or they can be marine. Okay? And the bigger picture is the biosphere. And he said the biosphere is the portion of the earth in which all life exists. Any part, any place on the earth where life exists, we call that place a biome. This includes the land, water, and air. So these are very, very important for us to understand. As a biome is any place on earth where life exists. So these are examples of what you call a terrestrial biomes. Terrestrial biomes. The first one is we are seeing a desert. And we talk about a desert is a barren place, a, a, a barren area of land or a deserted terrain. And, uh, and most of the time, the plants that, do, that grow in a desert, they are zero fights. Examples of these zero fights are these palm trees or these run palms. They are, they are resilient to dryness. They stay there for a long period of time. And uh, they can withstand dryness. Okay, that's what you call, these are desert plants, zero fights. The other thing also, we look at temperate forest. Some of these temperate, you say temperate forest is moderate and not excessive hot climate. A temperate forest is a place that is moderate and not excessively hot. Like for instance, if you have been riding or going to Birkama, you find uh, this Nyambai forest when you are going to Birkama on your right. But it's sudden now that the forest has disappeared. But uh, before the place was beautiful. If you are going around, if you are going to Birkama and you see the forest, and that has also contributed to a lot of rainfall for us. But nowadays, 
the place is just like a desert. But we said a temperate forest is a moderate and not excessive hot climate. And some countries there the experience is a rainforest. So another thing is that a rainforest biome. This one is a very thick place. A forest in which climate with high annual rainfall and no dry season. Uh, Gambia, we do not experience these types of hot weather uh, uh, because here we only have two seasons, wet and dry. And nowadays our wet season is only about two to three months because our forest vegetation has been destroyed. We don't have a, a thick forest that is going to help us to have more rains. So that's why we are encouraging each, each and every one of us to plant trees around our homes, to beautify our environment. This will help us by bringing more rain to us and our farmers will be happy to produce good crops for us. And at the end, we are going to be the ultimate uh, we, will be, be, we will have the ultimate goal by eating fresh fruits and with this is from fruits that have been ex imported from other parts of the, the country to, be, to the Gambia. We also talk about temperate grasslands. Environment that is not extreme or excessive heated. The temperate grassland and the temperate forest. Here, this grassland, we don't find much trees there. It's all a grassland. It's not extremely hot. Most of the lands in the Gambia is just like it's a temperate grassland. We also have a savanna. Savanna is a tropical grassland with scattered trees. <laughs> you can see the picture. The trees are scattered. You can count them one, two. You can count the, the, the number of trees there. The trees are scattered everywhere. We have the taiji, a subarctic zone of evergreen coniferous forest. These are what you call the the, the taiji. We have the tundra, a flat and treeless Arctic biome. This, this one, it does not have tre trees. They are treeless. It's a flat land and, and, and it's treeless. We have the capral, a region of shrubs, typically dry in the summer and rainy in the, in the winter, like a region of shrubs, trees, typically dry in the summer. Few things are existing there and wet during the rainy season. The alf, alfine, okay. Any of the several plants native to the mountain habitants. These ones, they are mostly found in mountainous areas like the avalanches. These, these areas, that's where, like the, some of these Asian countries, we find these places there. So we talked about terrestrial biome. So now we are moving to what? Marine biomes. We have fresh water, a stream of springs of water. Like most of the time, if we go around some of these villages, we have what we call fresh water. In this fresh water, we have streams of what? Uh, streams of water, like for instance, uh, some places like Pansan, some places like Bruvud. We have a lot of this fresh water during the rainy season. Sometimes we even go on, on fishing. Okay, in some of these uh, villages, we have some of this fresh water there. And then we have fresh water wetlands and areas that is characteristically saturated. Like for instance, if you, uh, we are, the picture that we are seeing here, this uh, uh, examples of what freshwater wetlands, and uh, it saturated a lot of things, organisms, fish, some, some things are all saturated. They are all there. The the, the place is a, is a bit rich of what some organisms and some nutrients, and marine, basically the sea, the oceans, the coral reefs. Back again, we are talking about the coral reefs. These are hard substances made of what, limestone skeleton of marine polyps. The estuaries, and we said we are ocean tides and river water meets or emerge. So there are some questions that we are going to be looking at from what we have just discussed. I, um, I just want to test your ability whether we are understanding what we, we are discussing. Say which of the following levels of biological organization include all the others? We say a community, an ecosystem, organism, and population. Okay, we'll find out that uh, this uh, the, the correct answer is ecosystem. That is option B, which is the correct answer, the ecosystem. So now we are moving to a Population ecology. 
So in this population ecology, we are going to be looking at factors, a habitant or niche. We are going to look at population growth, common ecological instruments. If time permits us, we will look at all these things today. First of all, what is population ecology? We say population ecology studies the interactions between a population and its environment. We have to look at the interaction between a particular population and the environment in which that population is. Like for instance, in a, in a, in a school, you have to look at the population ecology of the students with some of the things that they interact with in the school. They interact with teachers, they interact with their books, they go to the library to read, they go to the computer classes, they have discussions under the trees, they are interacting with their environment. They, they even have to go to the garden to study it and to look at some of the things that they are doing. They are doing, they are interacting with their environment to, making their, to, uh, to enhance their learning, to make their learning easy. So now, here, we are look, the picture that we are seeing, we are seeing a toad. We say a population ecology studies the interactions between a population and its environment. And that picture is a toad that we are seeing. So now, the water holding frog of Australian burrows into the ground during the dry season. That means that it digs inside the ground during the dry season. Okay? It surrounds itself with what? Water tight mucus secretion. So now, when it digs inside the ground, there is a there's watertight secretion that, that surrounds its environment. And that watertight secretion, it plays an important role in protecting the, 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 the toad okay, or the frog. Okay, it's tight mucus secretion that acts uh, as a cocoon or a protective case. It protects the frog. When it rains, the frog emerges to lay eggs. So during the rainy season, the frog lays eggs and these eggs hatch and develop into tadpoles and quickly before the paddles disappear before that water that was there simply disappeared so now that means that the frog is able to, uh, to lay eggs the eggs are hatched developed to tadpoles before the water disappears all those toads they are matured and they start what moving around on their on their own so factors Populations are affected, all populations are affected negatively or positively by a variety of factors in their environment. Like for instance, human beings, we are affected positively or negatively by some of the factors that are surrounding us, either by feeding or we don't have work, we don't have housing, we don't have proper education. These are some of the factors Okay, but thank God that now the, the Gambia education system, they're encouraging no one to be left out of school. We should all be in school. So we should thank our government for that and our, our, our ministry for that. We said the surrogate cartus, so this, this is an example that we are seeing. We are seeing a picture of a cartus. And this type of cartus, they are not easily found in our region here. They are found in most of these countries like Mexico. This is what you call the surrogate cartus, are desert plants with adaptation that enable it to live in dry conditions. This cactus has the ability to live, because by looking at the cactus and the trees that are, the shrubs that are around it, you see there are differences. This cactus, the outer covering is a bit thick and succulent. That's enable it to live under hard conditions or, or conditions that are extremely hard. Okay, this cactus will be able to, to live in those types of environment. Okay. They have one large taproot that extends into the ground with small, shallow roots that quickly absorb any water that falls. So now if you look at this cactus, there's one taproot, there's one main root that extends deep inside the soil, okay, and deep inside the ground, and it's able to have, have what water. It's able to have, absorb nutrients from that taproot, and there are small, shallow roots, roots that are not deeply rooted in the ground. The cactus has some spines. The spine helps channel water, redirect wind, protect the cactus from animals, and insulate and separate the cactus. Okay? Some animals, such as pack rats, eat the cactus. Other animals, such as bats, eat the fruits of the, the cactus, aiding 
in pollination and dispersal of seeds. A question. Name one positive factor and one negative factor that affects the cactus or the surrogate. So in this, we are seeing that there are what you call the negative factors and the positive factors. So I will not do it for you. I will, I will leave it for you to try and see the outcome. Positive factors and the negative factors that affect the cactus. Okay? So now, when you talk about the, the factors, we said we have what you call abiotic factors and the, and the uh, biotic factors. So, but today, uh, for now, we are going to be looking at what you call abiotic factors. Abiotic factors are physical, non-living factors that shape an organism. These are physical, non-living organisms that shape an organism. On the screen, what we are seeing there, we are seeing the sun is a, is a factor. We see rainfall is a factor. We see the wind is a factor. And temperature is a factor. So these factors, we call them, they are non-living factors. They are abiotic. So if you look at that, in that red uh, square or box, we said it's a sunlight is a factor. Precipitation. And when you talk about precipitation, we are talking about rain. It's a factor. These are abiotic factors. And then talk about temperature. Okay? And you said, and we see that thermometer there is to represent the temperature, the unit in which we measure temperature, how hot or cold a substance is. And also talk about the wind. You can see the image there of demonstrating the wind, the soil type, and Newton's availability. So on the soil type, it's here in the next slide. The soil type. We talk about there are some crops they do well in a particular soil, whereas others do not do well in that particular soil. So as a farmer, you should know which type of crops that you grow in this soil and what type of crop you grow in that other soil. It's very, very important to know that as a farmer. Okay? And also, when you grow these crops, there are also nutrients. Nutrients that are needed. We talked up earlier on, on, on the macronutrients, and micronutrients, the nutrients that are needed by a plant in large quantity and nutrients that are needed by the plant in small quantity. So these are the things that we said, the abiotic factors, the non-living factors, okay? So now we move on to what you call biotic factors. These are the factors that are living, the living things that make up an ecosystem. <laughs> if we can see on the screen, different organisms there. We have the plants, we have the animals, we have the fungi like the, mus uh, the mushroom, and we have also bacteria. And some, you know, we, we cannot see bacteria here. If at all, if we can see it with our naked eyes, we are able to, uh, to trace it out there. Okay? So these are the living factors that affect an ecosystem. So now let's go back. Let's recap <laughs> the, uh, the cactus. So you know, I told you that, you know, the cactus, I was going to leave it for you. So, but now I brought the question again. So, we are going to revisit this, the, this, the cactus. You said the Sologes cactus are desert plant, which have adaptation that enable it to live in dry conditions. They have one large taproot that extends into the ground with small, shallow roots that quickly absorb any water that falls. Spines help to channel water, redirect the wind, protect the cactus from the animals, and isolate the cactus. Some animals, such as park rats, eat the cactus. Other animals, such as bats, eat the fruits of the cactus, aiding in pollination and dispersal of seeds. List two abiotic and two biotic factors that affects the surrogate cactus. I think by now, you should be able to list some of those factors. Please remember, we said abiotic factors are those are the non-living things. And we said the biotic, they are the living things. So I'll leave, it, I'll leave these questions uh, to you to try it by yourself, whether, whether you can do it. I guess by now you should be able to do that question.
We says all of the following are abiotic factors, except. And what do you say about abiotic factors? They are the non-living. I guess now you remember that the non-living organisms. Okay? We say microorganisms. The pH, temperature, nutrients. So I'll give you five seconds to think about it and come up with an answer. I guess, uh, how many of you selected A? Yes, A is the correct answer. All of the following are abiotic factors, except A. A is a, is a living organism. That we talk about microorganisms, they are living. Okay, that's like, for instance, bacteria and other things. It says, which of the following leaves, which of the following levels of biological organization includes both abiotic and biotic factors? We said abiotic factors are the, the non-living, and biotic factors are the living. We said which of them? Please, I'm giving you another five seconds again to select the right option. Can I read the question again? Okay, let me read it. Which of the following levels of biological organizations include both abiotic factors and biotic factors? A, species. B, population. C, community. D, ecosystem. Yes, D is the correct answer. Uh, those who selected uh, D, you are right, is the correct answer. Those who do not get it, please try the next, next time again. You may have it. Okay. Here's another question again. It says sea turtle undergoes temperature dependent sex determination. That means that the sex of the sea turtle is determined by the temperature. Whether the sea turtle is a male or a female, that is determined by the temperature. The prevailing temperature during embryonic development at the early stage of developmental stage, yeah, during fertilization and the embryonic development of this. The, uh, this is determine the sex of, determines the sex of the turtle. Warm temperature results to female, while cold temperature results to a to male. What type of factors influence the sex of the, uh, the sea turtle? It is A or B. I think this one is an easy question for you to know. Yeah? We said, which one is a living? We said, what type of factors influence the sex of uh, the sea turtle? Temperature, it is living. Is the, the temperature is what we are discussing about here. So I give you five seconds again to discuss, uh, to come up with the answer. Okay? So those of you select, you choose B, you are right. The correct answer is abiotic factors. B is the correct answer. So now we are looking at a habitat. Okay? We have different, eco, we have different populations and we have different communities interacting together. Okay, in this habitat. So now they say the term habitat describes the specific area, including biotic and abiotic factors, where an organism lives within an ecosystem. It includes biotic and abiotic factors, where organisms live in an ecosystem. We say a habitat is like an organism's home within an ecosystem. Like, for instance, you are seeing this ecosystem. Okay, an organism can decide to go and stay in a particular area. Okay, can decide to go and stay in a particular area or to, to live in a particular place. So that's what you call a habitat. It's a particular home of an organism. Okay, this is a, an ecosystem to show you as a habitat of an organism. So now we are looking at what you call ecological niche. An ecological niche is a description of a role an organism plays in its habitat. You are describing a role the organism plays in its habitat. A niche includes all aspects of where an organism is and how it lives. Where the organism is and how that organism lives. We are talking about the ecological niche. An ecological niche includes the following, the types of food the organism eats, how it obtains food, how that organism obtains food, where that organism lives in its environment, like for instance, the trees, the nest, the hive, etc. And then when and how it reproduces. 
the time, when, and how. How does it do its reproduction? So that is it. If you look at this uh, image here, you look at a dragon niche, uh, a Kamura dragon niche. This ecological niche of this organism, it has the ability to move around in these areas and as a place to, what, to rest or a hole where it goes and what rests. Uh, like this type of reptiles you call the kana. Okay? It's a very, during rainy season, these types of organisms are very common in the, in the bush. You go around, you see them, or sometimes you are frightened by them, they come after our chickens. Okay? This, are the, this is a particular form of a reptile. I, I want to explain the ecological niche in relation to my principles. So like for instance, in the school, it has, uh, it has different things that it, it looks after or he has to look at the, the, the welfare of the school. And one of the things that he does, he look at the teachers, how they are delivering in their classes. He goes around to see the, uh, whether people are coming to school on time or not. He sees the students, whether they are disturbing or not. If any time that he hears the noise, him and the vice principal, he goes around and to check. And sometimes he goes to the mosque during the prayer hours to, uh, to, re, uh, to pray and also from time to time, he visits the gardens to check how the, thing, the work is being done and to supervise the projects that have been going around in the school. All those activities he's doing, that's what it has, is ecological niche in the school. It's not only that particular place, where he, his office, where he sits and do his activity. That is not, that is, that's just like a habitat for that place. But his ecological niche, all the activities that he's, he's, he's supervising, in the school, and then some of the projects that he's going to, is looking at, is part of his ecological niche. Still, we are stressing an ecological niche, so that we not miss ecological niche and a habitat. We said we are looking at this image. No two species can occupy the same niche in the same environment at the same time. Like for instance, as I use the example of Mr. Jang, Mr. Jang and Mr. Gay, they cannot use the same office and do their work at the same time. So that's why Mr. Jain has an office. Mr. Gay, the vice principal, also has his office. So they, they have different places where they operate. So now he says no two species, no two people can occupy the same ecological niche in the same environment at the same time. If this occurs, competition for resources will display one of the, of the species. So now if this thing happens, if they are in the same place, they are going to be competing for resources. These organisms will also compete for resources. Which one will be displaced and which one will remain? So the one that is will be displayed is the one that is like the weaker one will have to go and leave the space for that, for the for, for the for the one that is stronger or the one that is what is having more authority. The figure below shows three different species of what web webbers that have established different niches in the same tree. <laughs> you see, we can see here the the tree is about 18 meters tall. Okay, and we have three birds that are uh, occupying different niche on the tree. Okay, on the right hand side, we say we have bay breasted weber. Okay, this type of bird, it is uh, the niche is in the middle. And then you move on to the right hand side, the yellow from the down, we have uh, the yellow ramped weber feeds in the lower parts of the tree and at the basis of the middle branches. You see, where, where the circle is, that's where it feeds, at the lower part of the tree and at the base, and where is that, that's where it has its own ecological niche. It does not go to the other side. And then you have the, the Cape May, Weber, feeds at the tip of the branches near the top of uh, the tree. So these three organisms, they sow, their ecological niche are sown in this, in their, in their way of all their activities here. As I said, ecological niche is not just a particular portion. And it's that area that surrounds that organism. Okay? That is ecological niche. So now, an American green tree frog lives in the southern, in the southern upper state near bodies of what water that have plentiful vegetation. This is the frogs, a habitat or a niche. Looking, 
They don't just stay in one place. And also, while they are hunting, they are also going around looking for what? For organisms. So now we talk about population growth. Ecologists are interested in how population change over time. Okay? That's supposed to be one of the factors that we have to look at. Uh, population growth. Like in the Gambia here, if you look at the KMC, population growth is rampant. It's, it's increasing. People are coming from the, from the provinces, coming to the, to the urban areas for what? Greener pasture. They want to have a white collar job. They want to, uh, to, to have daily sustenance every day. But these things, they have to move from those areas to the, other, to, to the urban areas here. It says population growth is dependent on the number of births and the number of deaths, okay? And the number of individuals who enters or leaves a population. And here, we talk about immigration and immigra immigration. E, immigration and immigration. That means E, E-M-I-G-R-A-T-I-O-N. That means you are leaving and entering a particular area. Okay? You are leaving a particular place. You are immigrating. Like uh, somebody is coming from Guinea-Bissau Bissau or from, from Senegal entering to the Gambia. is immigrating. is leaving Senegal, coming to the Gambia for a, pass, for a permanent resident in the Gambia. Birds. Some are immigrating, entering to a particular environment or a particular territory. It could be as a result of what? food or it could be as a result of what a better habitat they are looking for okay so immig immigrating and immigration they are entering 